Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So first thing first, uh, I have to appear in a meeting at 12.45, so I'll take 45 minutes of lecture today. Okay. <laughs> You guys are in an AC room, come on. It can't be that bad. All right. Uh, so any questions from the networking lecture, let, networking chapter? Any questions from there? No questions? OK. All right, so I'll start the new topic, uh, and that's basically called device driver. The question is, what is the device driver, right? <clears throat> and why do we need one? So all the devices that we use on the system, right, uh, requires to be operated, right? So. You have the hardware device, like for example, you have the disk drive. You have to format the disk drive, and then the data is stored in a particular format, right? Uh, you have the network devices on your system, Ethernet port. You need to be able to, in you know, use that hardware. So there has to be some software running as part of your operating system that will communicate to that hardware to take the work done from that hardware, right? So that is the basic idea behind the uh, device driver. So the device driver is a software which will run or which will take, uh, which will make use of the hardware, right? So let me just zoom this a little bit. <clears throat> so this is what we know, system call interface. And this is what we as a user or a programmer use. So whatever uh, you know, calls that we have made, uh, whether it is open call, read, write call, pipe call, fork call, whatever calls that we have made, they all belong to the system call interface. Okay. Now, the system call interface interacts with the kernel module, right? And these are all the kernel modules we have. Okay. So kernel subsystems are basically the systems which are uh, taking help from each of the hardware devices that you have on the system. So for example, you have the process management system, which will implement concurrency and multitasking because you have multiple cores in your system, right? So you have multiple CPUs, multiple cores in your system to take an advantage of that. Your kernel module process management needs to implement concurrency, multitasking, locking mechanism, all of that. Right. And that also has to be done using the architecture dependent code. So why it is an architecture uh, dependent code is because let's say on my laptop, I may be using, uh, you know, Intel based processor uh, on your phone or maybe, uh, uh, you know, on Apple Mac, you would be using ARM based processor. Right. So that is what we are saying architecture dependent code. Okay. Then you have the memory management, right, that you have to perform where one of the important concept is called virtual memory. Uh, what does virtual memory do? So basically what happens is that most of the computer today, uh, general, general purpose computer, which we call desktop laptops, they come with like 8 GB, 16 GB of RAM, right? But the data that you really need to put in RAM is much larger than that, okay? So what happens is that the kernel module, which is uh, managing the memory management, uh, it creates what we call virtual pages or virtual memory in your disk, okay? And there will be a special routine which does the swapping. So it identifies that which uh, memory blocks are not frequently used, and those blocks can be put onto the disk, and the blocks which are frequently used, they will be placed in the regular RAM so that you have a faster access to those uh, memory modules, right? So that is one of the function, important function of the memory management model. Also, another thing uh, 
uh, we have seen that uh, you have a data memory, you have program memory, right? Uh, you have a heap, you have a stack, all of those different kinds of memories you have, right? So which of which part of your physical memory will be divided into each of those segments? That is also one of the function of memory management model. Okay. So all these functionalities are to be performed by the memory management. Then you have the file system module where <clears throat> we manage what we call block devices. So when we talk about the device drivers, uh, they generally deal with three types of devices. One is the character device. Uh, second one is the block device. Third one is the network device. Okay. This. So say, I Somebody in <laughs> And because the mic is right here, is echoing that. Uh, so, character device, block device, network device, CDs, USBs, uh, DVDs, all of these are block device. Okay. Your uh, keyboard, display, those devices are so generally console based devices are your uh, character based device. And then you have the network ports, which is Bluetooth. Uh, your ethernet and all of that, right? That will be your network device. So uh, this module basically deals with only file system, which is either it can be on the USB drive, it can be on the uh, DVD or uh, DVD CD or your uh, disks, regular disks, right? Hard drives. Yeah. Is there device, yeah. device and every hardware component? Correct. Every single, every single hardware component that you have in your system for each one of them, there will be a separate driver. Uh, so for CPU, you have this uh, process management module, which will have uh, different uh, components that will say that how the allocation of the task or the application should be done to a particular CPU. And remember, I told you that you know when you have a large IO activity that happens in your application, then that process will go into a sleep mode. So all of that scheduling part uh, is, a, is a special code that is in the kernel and that takes care of all of that. So device driver specifically, we generally use the term device driver mainly for IO devices, input output devices, not generally for CPU, right? So, uh, so I mean, you know, when you have file system, when you have the uh, keyboard, mouse, all of those devices, we generally call it as device driver, right? For the memory system, for the process management or CPU management, generally we don't call it as device driver because device means your uh, IO devices, okay? Yeah. Uh, the block devices are, like I said, uh, anything where you write or read a block of data at a time. So uh, this can be, you know, your, your disk drive can be a block device, your USB drive can be a block device. Uh, so anything where you write data, not in a single byte, but multiple bytes at a time. That is what we call block device. So I'll come to that actually in the next slide. But uh, so then you have the uh, TTYs, which uh, stands for teletype devices, and they are primarily your uh, keyboards, displays and all that. Uh, they are your character devices, right? So single by single character at a time that you would read and write from those devices. And then finally, you have the networking, uh, networking subsystem, which is interfacing with the network devices. So generally, these type of resources your system has to manage. And for each of these, you will have a separate module. Okay, as I said, three types of devices generally we deal with character device, which is uh, your console, keyboard, mouse, etc. Now, of course, if your mouse is uh, USB mouse, then uh, you will have the USB uh, device driver, which will be managing the mouse. Uh, then you have the block devices. So the difference primarily between the character device and the block device is that you know, only single process will be allowed to use your character device in the sense that only one process can read and write, uh, you know, from the keyboard and the screen, 
right? Not multiple devices, multiple applications cannot access that device. But when we talk about the block device, multiple applications can access the block devices. So for example, USB drives can be used by multiple application at the same time, right? Uh, but not the keyboard. Okay. And then uh, you have the network device, which are like Ethernet card or uh, Bluetooth or something like that. Now, uh, what we will do through this uh, chapter is, uh, uh, you know, I've provided this link. Uh, if you are interested in this particular topic uh, to learn in detail, go through this link. This is basically a book uh, link. Uh, it's about 20, I think 20 odd chapters uh, book. Uh, the device driver actually is a very big topic. Uh, so and I won't be able to cover like complete topic here, uh, but we'll create a small device driver for a character device, which is generally covered, I think, in chapter two and three in the book. Uh, then they have covered many other device drivers like USB device drivers uh, for the other types of devices. Also, they have covered some of the drivers. So if you are interested in that, you can you know dig more into it and uh, learn more into it. But uh, just, I mean, this chapter is primarily, again, to give you the introduction about how do we create a simple device driver, right? So when you create the device driver, we need to define certain information in our module. Uh, by the way, device driver belongs to the kernel area, right? So whatever code that we will implement will not actually have an executable file. You don't run an executable for a device driver. Device driver will have a special type of object code uh, or a binary code, which will be uh, like kernel module. Okay. So we don't have a main function here in the device driver because all of the programs will have the main function, generally speaking, right? But here we will not have the main function. We will provide the licensing information, you know, uh, author information, module description, and then the version. Right. So these four information you can provide by using a special macros that are defined by the uh, kernel, uh, module license, module author, module description, and module version. So these four macros we can use to define this four information. Now, as I said, uh, the device driver code is actually part of a kernel uh, or will have to be part of the kernel. And so we don't actually have the main function for it uh, because we don't run an executable. So what the operating system allows us to do is that we can define our own init function, right, or initialization function, where you can declare your global variables or, uh, you know, uh, create your heap uh, variables or anything like that, initialization and things like that, which we can call it as constructor, right? And you use this special system call called module init, which is where you will provide the address of the uh, init function that you have created in your code. Okay, so by providing the function name here, primarily what we are doing is we are telling the kernel what is the name of the init module or what is the address of the init module that we have written in our code, so that when the device driver is loaded into the memory, that is the first function that the kernel will execute for the driver. Okay, because we don't have the main function. Right? There is no main function. So because there is no fun main function, there has to be some starting point. Right? So what is the starting point in the device driver? The starting point is the init function, which I have created and I have told kernel, you know, which function to start from. Okay? So that is what this uh, init uh, module init does. Similarly, we can create an exit function of our own. And then we tell the kernel, what is our exit function? So let's say you have used, uh, you know, uh, variable global variable called uh, uh, something, and then you've done malloc, right? So uh, are you guys familiar with malloc? Yes. yes. So what does malloc do? Malloc creates a global variable which is uh, a memory space allocated in the heap, right? Heap is a special memory which keeps track of all the global variables. Okay. So when you have the uh, variable created in the heap, once you're done with your application, you need to free up all the space, right? Because you cannot just, uh, you know, 
go away from the application and keep the memory allocated. Right? Why is that? Because at some point, what will happen is you will take up all the memory in your computer and your computer will freeze. The only way to recover from that is to reboot the system. Okay? And this, this problem that I'm describing is what is called memory leak. Okay? So if you Google it up, you will find out that uh, this is a common problem, especially when you write uh, a code with the lower level languages like C, where you can allocate uh, memory on your own and use pointers, right? So uh, you end up having memory leaks if you don't manage the memory well. This is one of the main reason uh, other languages such as uh, Java, Python, they don't allow you to, you know, do memory management on your own. They do memory management for you, okay? So that they fix all of these memory leak problems for you. They don't, uh, you know, allow you to touch the heap. That is what they do, right? But anyway, uh, this is also one of the reasons that these languages cannot be used in uh, kernel programming. Okay. Now, when we uh, use your normal application in, in C, uh, we use printf statements, right? Uh, just to print the uh, certain messages. So here, because this is a kernel module, we cannot use printf, but we have to use printk. So printk is again a special function. Uh, which will allow you to print messages, but then you can also provide the log level or the priority of the messages, right? So what kind of message that you are displaying? Uh, is it a debug information, informational message, error, warning, critical error, whatever it is, right? So you can provide this information. Um, this sort of information goes into the log and a special log again, when we look at uh, the example, you will notice that this information goes into the special log and you can take corrective actions based on this log information. Okay. So uh, too much talk, right? Uh, six slides. Now seven slide, we go with a simple example. Okay. So we want to see how the uh, kernel modules are created. So even though I have said driver one, it's not actually, th this code does not actually do anything or it doesn't have any device driver related uh, code, okay? Uh, I will go through like five different examples and in each example, we will have an incremental uh, modification to the code. The last example, the fifth example is the real driver code, okay? Which is what actually the driver is, right? All the other code is just to show you the incremental changes that we can do to, a, uh, to create, to build the device driver, right? So simple code here, uh, my driver one. These are the header files that we will need. And if you see, it is in the Linux directory. Okay. And we are using the header files from the kernel modules. So all of these header files are actually coming from the source of the kernel. Okay. And therefore, the compilation process for this module is also slightly different, which I'll explain through the make file. But for now, we have to declare our init function, right? So this is my init function. And I'm just putting these two print case. Um, it's just informational messages. It's just saying that uh, it's a simple module and the module is inserted. And then in the exit function, again, we are just saying that the module is removed so that we know that when the module is loaded and when the module is removed. And then these are these two uh, module init and module exit system calls, which is then defining what is my init function and what is my exit function for the kernel to execute, right? And then these are the four macros that I've used for defining the license, author, description, and version, okay? So you can see that this code doesn't have our normal, uh, you know, uh, flow, right? It doesn't have main, it doesn't have function calls, it doesn't have anything like that. Uh, it's just these two uh, simple functions which are there. Now, how do we compile this code? Right. So, in order to compile this code, <coughs> we write this uh, special make file. Okay. And uh, this make file is actually, uh, you know, it's a recursive make file. In the sense that this make file 
will be calling a make file from the kernel code and that make file will be again calling this make file to compile our code okay so that's why we are calling recursive so the, basically this make file is called twice one when we execute second time when kernel calls this make file okay and how does it work so basically if you see that uh, there is a variable here which i am using called kernel release okay and this is an if statement that is checking whether the kernel release variable is set or not okay whether the value in the kernel release variable is set or not that is what this if condition is checking in the first time when i execute this make file the kernel uh, release variable is not set okay so it's going to go and go to the else part it's going to declare this uh, initialize this variable kernel directory and if you see this is the path to the kernel directory okay if you see this part in the middle this is trying to get what is the current kernel version that i am running because i could have multiple kernel versions sitting on my system right but which kernel version i have booted from that is the kernel version i need to use here so u name minus r is going to give me the current booted kernel version okay so that is what i am going to replace here okay so it's going to go to lib modules the kernel version and the build this folder okay and that is where i have a make file which is the kernel's make file okay <clears throat> uh, and then i'm going to set what is my current uh, path right uh, so that when the kernel make file needs to call this make file it knows where my make file is okay so i'm going to call the make file in the kernel directory and then that make file is going to call this make file again okay uh, <clears throat> so this is the make command that i am executing <clears throat> and this make command is going to run in a kernel directory because i am saying minus c switch so if you look at the man page for make So minus C switch, you provide the directory and it says that change to that directory before reading the make file or doing anything else. Okay. What does it mean? It means that you first go to that directory and then run the make file from that directory. That is what you're trying to do. Right. Uh, so now that directory is, is what? It is this one, right? Because we are providing the kernel directory as the path for that minus C switch, okay? So it's going to go to this directory, okay? And if I do U name minus R, this is my current kernel version that I am currently running, okay? So what I'll do is I'll go to that particular folder. So I go to other locations, here, uh, lib, modules and then i look for that version number i think it was this one 37 and then build and then in this build there is a make file here okay so this is the make file that i will be executing okay this is the make file I will be executing. And uh, if you see the make file is about 1794 lines. So obviously I will not have time to explain all the uh, commands there. But uh, what you have to believe me is that uh, we are running the label modules. If you look at our make file, right? If you look at our make file, uh, there is a modules word here, right? So this is the label which I am executing from that make file, right? So if you look at this make file, there is a 
modules label here. So this is the part of make file which I'm executing. And if you dig down a little bit, if you are interested, you can dig down on this uh, make file dot mode pause. Eventually, it comes back to our make file. Okay, that 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 make file executes our make file. But when it executes the make file, the kernel release variable is now set. Okay, so kernel release variable will be set inside this make file, and that is what is going to be used uh, for the if part here. So now, next time when this make file is called, this variable is set. And because this variable is set, I'm going to set obj minus m variable, and I'm going to say what is the object file I want to create. Again, it is going to call this make file. But this time, it is going to compile my code. So basically, there is two, two times the kernel make files is being called, and two times my make file is going. This make file is going is being called um, to compile the code. Okay, that is what is happening, and this is the only way to compile a device driver code uh, using the kernel. So this is a standard make file which. Most of the, even if you create your own system calls, for example, if you create a, your own system call which you want to include in the kernel, same make file you will have to use. So any kernel module you want to compile, any new code that you want to include in the kernel, this is the make file that you will be using. Okay. <clears throat> any questions? Okay. So let me first compile the code. Now, one important thing that you have to note, uh, note is that uh, because this is a kernel code and we require access to the header file, which are the kernel header files, uh, we cannot compile this code in this folder. Because this folder is the mapped folder or mounted folder from the Windows file system. Windows file system does not have the Linux header files. Okay. So whenever you want to compile any kernel level code, you have to copy that code into the local file system in the Linux file system. And that is where you will have to compile. Okay. So what I'll do is actually I'll go to the home folder. There I've created the device driver folder and I've copied the C files and the make files over here. Okay. So that we can actually compile here. Uh, so I'll just copy the my driver one make file to make file. Okay. So now make file will look like the one that I want to execute. And so I'll say first, let me just clean in case if there are any ports which are created. So I'll first do the clean and then I will compile. Okay. So when you compile, you will notice that uh, there are several files that are created and and uh, you know if you look at the output i'll point out a couple of things uh, one thing is that if you see in the make file uh, these are the three variables which we are printing okay make variable we are printing pwd we are printing and kernel release we are printing okay now i said that this make file is being called twice and i can prove to you that uh, the way i can prove it because if you see those three variables are printed here first, right? And if you see the kernel release, it doesn't have any value, right? It is and then there is nothing, okay? And then it does call the kernel code, right? Somewhere here, this is the uh, kernel code, kernel make file will be called here. And then that kernel make file is again calling our make file. And so it is displaying the same three variables again, second time, right? So it, when it is doing that, you will see that the kernel release variable is having a value now because this variable was set inside this make file, which is what we got from the kernel set. Okay. So once we have this variable declared uh, or initialized with this kernel uh, version number, now the else part will start running and now we are uh, uh, we are running we are creating this object file so this is the 
second time that kernel uh, make file is being called and then again the third time our uh, make file is called and then finally all the compilation is happening here so there is like back and forth going two three times right between the make file of the kernel and the make file that we have created and then finally the object file gets created uh, and if you look at uh, this um, uh, make file dot more post it actually gives you the steps uh, it gives you the steps that why these four files are being created it has the uh, comments there which you can read if you are interested but in in short we are primarily interested in this object file a dot ko file so that dot ko is the uh, extension for kernel object right so normally we create a dot o file which is the object file which is the binary code compiled code of the c file but because we are compiling a kernel uh, kernel object right the header files that we are using is from the kernel side it's going to create a dot ko file and that is what we will use as our binary file and that is what we will have to load it into the memory for uh, drivers, right, or device drivers. Okay. So how do we how do we load that? Right now, this is a dot ko file. I cannot really run it uh, as an executable. So how do we load that? So we have a command called ins mode. Ins mode is the command that basically says insert module. And we provide the .ko file to that, which will be then loading that .ko file into the memory. LS mod, mod stands for module. Right? So LS mod basically gives you the list of all the modules which are currently loaded, meaning all the device drivers that are currently loaded, whatever is running right now. Right? And then RM mode is what uh, we can use to remove the uh, module. Print key messages are going to a special log, as I was saying. So we, if you want to list those, how would you see the messages from that log? D message is the command for that. Okay. So we can't really see that uh, those messages on the console, on the screen, because those are going to the special log on the system side. Okay. So you can use D message for displaying that message. So let us first look at all the modules which are loaded. So these are all the drivers which are already running on the system. Okay. And uh, if I do ls mod grep my driver one, you won't find anything because it's not loaded right now. Right. So I need to load it. Uh, in order to load, I need to be a super user. Now, if I run my ls, then it says that the module is loaded. Okay. Now, how do I know? There's another way to check it, whether the module is loaded or not. If I run the message, you will see that the last two lines are coming from that special log, right? And these are the two print case I've done in my init function. So that means when the module is loaded, the kernel has executed the init function, right? The init function that I wrote in my code. Okay, so this is how I know that the uh, the module is loaded into the memory. Okay, now, of course this module doesn't do anything, right? So I can just remove it because it just has init and exit function. That's all. Right? So there is really no driver as such. There is no device as such here. Uh, it's just that this example is just showing you how to create a kernel object and load it into the memory. That's all. So I'll remove it. Again, if we do ls, it's gone. And if we do the message, you will notice that the kernel module is removed successfully. So that means the exit function is now executed. Okay, so when you load the module, the init function is executed by kernel. When you 
remove the module, the exit function will be sorry, in it initially and then the exit when you exit the code. Okay. So this is how your uh, modules can be started off for writing the device driver. Right? Just a very simple code, just to show you how to load module, remove the module. That's all. <clears throat> Any questions? Clear, everyone? Okay. Yeah. How are? So that's what I'm saying. It's not executed. It's executed by kernel. Right. So when you when you write the code and when you load it into the memory, the memory already has the code. Right. Uh, the kernel knows where the module is loaded. So when you try to use it, kernel knows and you are not directly calling the module. You are calling the kernel system call. And so when you call the kernel system call, this is so what I'm saying is that if you wait till example five, you will get all your answers. <laughs> so wait till example five, please. It's an incremental. See, I, I can show you a example five in the first shot itself, but then, you know, uh, it will be difficult for you to make heads and tails out of it. Right. Uh, so for example, this is like, So if I explain to you this now, it won't be easy for you, right? So what I'm doing is I'm going through incremental changes. So one step at a time, right? Better way to learn is one step at a time, right? So I know your generation is faster and you want to do everything faster, but sometimes you got to take, you know, that halt. Otherwise uh, you will burn out. Sorry? No, no, I understand that. And, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, many students have the same questions in their mind. So, so let me stop here. Uh, because the next part, I'll take probably 15 minutes, 20 minutes more. Yeah. Yes. So, so basically what happens is that the make, the kernel make file is called twice. And then the third time, the kernel make file is calling our our file to compile the code. So last call to our make file is compilation. The first two is just to generate the messages. It's just to collect the data. So first time that kernel dir will be set. Second time that obj m will be set. And third time the actual compilation will happen. Thank <laughs> you.